I will start by looking at a simple diagram which has the right shoulder joint seen from an anterior viewpoint as well as elements of the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton elements that are seen here include the vertebral column and the ribs. And I'm going to remove these as well as the clavicle. We are and we are now left with just two bones that participate in the formation of the shoulder joint. The first one of these is the scapula. It is seen here as a large, flat, triangular bone, and it articulates with the proximal end of the humerus, which is the single bone of the arm. The scapula itself, if you observe the scapula, it has an inferior pointed end, which is known as the inferior angle. And from this inferior angle, we see two borders that diverge away from each other. One of those is on the medial side and is called the medial border of the scapula, as being traced out here. The other side is known as the lateral border of the scapula, and it is traced out here in yellow. These two borders, as they go superiorly, they diverge from each other and they have some very important structures in the form of prominences that one can see. The first one of these is known as the coracoid process, and it is being labeled here. The coracoid process is a projection of bone that is projecting laterally as well as anteriorly, and it's shaped like the beak of a bird, and hence the name coracoid. There's a second projection, which is much larger than the first, known as the acromion process, and it is seen here. The acromion process is a rectangular piece of bone that is the highest point of the scapula, or the highest point of the shoulder region, and hence the name acromion, ac acro meaning high, and it's a root word that is often used in other uh, medical conditions as well, medical structures like acromegaly, which means uh, height, uh, or somebody who is extra tall, and, uh, and so acro and acromion come from the same root. There's a third important structure that is seen in the superior lateral part of the scapula. This is the glenoid cavity, and it's, point, uh, it's labeled here. The glenoid cavity is a relatively shallow cavity, but it articulates with the head of the humerus to form a ball and socket joint. The ball is formed by the head of the humerus. The socket is formed by the glenoid cavity. And in order to deepen this glenoid cavity, there is a fibrocartilaginous ring known as the glenoid labrum that is sitting around the circumference of this glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity is somewhat deepened by the glenoid labrum, and it adds an element of stability. The design of the ball and socket joint, the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint proper, is for mobility and you will observe that the shoulder joint has a very great range of movement, but inherently it is also unstable because of the fact that it's designed for mobility rather than stability. Let's now proceed to our next slide and add back the clavicle that we had removed as well as the sternum. And we can now look at the joints that we talked about. So this is the clavicle here. It's a long bone and is fairly unique in, in many regards. Uh, what is relevant here is that it's a long bone that sits horizontally rather than in, this, in its vertical orientation, which many other long bones are positioned in, such as the humerus, which is also a long bone, and it sits in the anatomical position in a vertical alignment. The glenohumeral joint, which is the joint that we just described between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity, is seen here, and that gives us our orientation for the remainder of this slide. If we focus on the medial end of the clavicle, it articulates with the manubrium, which is the superior part of the sternum, and it forms another joint known as the sternoclavicular joint. This is uh, also a synovial joint, like the glenohumeral joint, but it is a very stable joint. It's uh, bounded by ligaments and capsule, and uh, it's, in fact, the only real articulation, uh, real joint, between the entire upper limb and the axial skeleton. 
the rest of the upper limb is attached to the axial skeleton uh, and the axial structures by soft tissue. Sternoclavicular joint is truly the only uh, bony articulation between the entire upper limb and the axial skeleton. So it's a strong joint and has tremendous capacity for, uh, for load bearing. The lateral end of the clavicle uh, is also in articulation with the bony structure that we just looked at, the acromion process, and forms the acromioclavicular joint. This is a joint that is often uh, dislocated uh, in sports injury or other forceful trauma around the uh, summit of the shoulder. And uh, the word that is often used for this is called shoulder separation. This is very different from a true shoulder joint dislocation of the glenohumeral joint, which is also a very common uh, injury that is seen clinically. In addition to these uh, formal joints, there are a couple of uh, loosely called joints that are not truly joints, but in clinical practice, often the word joint is used to describe these uh, structures. And one of those is just beneath or inferior to the acromion, known as the subacromial joint. And note that we have put joint within quotes. It's not really a joint. It's the subacromial space. And uh, it has important structures in that, uh, in that space, such as the rotator cuff and uh, synovial cavities like, the, like a bursa. And it's often the seat for uh, chronic shoulder pain. And so it's an important anatomical structure that we need to be able to identify. Uh, from a functional standpoint, the blade of the scapula forms an articulation or a joint, again loosely defined, known as the scapulothoracic joint, where the blade of the scapula rotates uh, around the rib uh, cage itself. And this provides for a fairly significant amount of movement uh, of the shoulder joint itself. So if you think about the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint is the ball and socket joint, which is this, uh, the shoulder joint proper. But these other joints uh, around that glenohumeral joint, particularly the scapulothoracic joint, participates in the movements of the shoulder joint. And about one third of total movement occurs at these additional joints. Only about two thirds occurs at the glenohumeral joint. So let's look at a simple AP or an anteroposterior view x-ray of the right shoulder area. And we can identify certain structures in this film. The first one is the round head of the humerus, and I'm going to outline it like this. So this is the head of the humerus, and it articulates with the glenoid cavity, which is shaded in here. So this is the glenoid cavity. And this forms that ball and socket joint, or the glenohumeral joint, or shoulder joint proper. There are other structures that are also visible. The first one of those is the long bone that we have looked at earlier, the clavicle. And I'm going to outline that bone here in its entire course. So this is the clavicle. And note that its lateral end is articulating with the acromion process, as we just looked at in our line diagram. And I've outlined it here. And so this is the acromion process. And that forms the acromioclavicular joint. There's one other structure that we can see, the coracoid process which is outlined here in red. And this is that bony beak-like projection from the scapula just below or beneath or inferior to the clavicle. So these are some of the structures that we can see in a simple plain film uh, of the shoulder joint. And this is an anteroposterior or AP view. If we look at another uh, x-ray, same view, same right side shoulder joint, it looks a little different. And so let's trace out some of the structures that we've already looked at and identified in the previous diagrams. And so we have the scapula here. The head of the humerus, we can see the hemispherical head of the humerus outlined here. And the glenoid cavity is shaded over here. And you will instantly note that unlike the previous x-ray, where the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity were articulating with each other congruently. In this case, the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity appear to be away from each other. In fact, they are overlapping each other. 
The glenoid labrum is in this location, but it is not visible because it is fibrocartilaginous. But it is at the margin of the glenoid cavity, and we can estimate that this would be the location of the glenoid labrum. This is an x-ray of a dislocation of the glenohumeral joint, and classically described as an anterior, or more accurately, an anteroinferior dislocation. Whenever we talk about dislocations of joints, the traditional way in which they are described is the dislocation of the distal fragment in relationship to the proximal fragment. So the head of the humerus, which is the distal fragment at this joint, is anterior and inferior to the glenoid cavity. And hence, this will be called an antero-inferior dislocation.